Okay, welcome everybody. My name is Gabrielle Smith, and on behalf of the Pena Health Action Union, Junior ROTC Program, and Cook Learning Center, I would love to welcome you to this program commemorating the Martin Luther King Jr. holiday. We're very privileged to have as our guest speaker, Captain William T. Thompson, who joins us from Atlanta, Georgia. Captain T was the first African American from South Carolina to attend the U.S. Air Force Academy. He went on to be a successful airline captain, attorney, businessman, and government leader. As, a cap as Captain T speaks, please feel free to type any questions in the chat, and he will do his best to answer them with time permitting. Without further ado, welcome Captain T to Fennel School. Yay! Well, hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Great. And I'm going to, I'm getting a little bit of feedback. So I'm going to ask uh, if you're not to make sure you are muted. Okay, great. I think that's taking care of it. Well, um, thank you, Gabby, for that great introduction. And I have checked your weather today and you are having what we call a jab dip day in Hawaii. Now that's aviation terminology terminology for just another beautiful day in paradise. Back here in Atlanta, started out being a cloudy, cool day. The sun's out a little bit now, temperature's up to 50, but I'd much rather be out there in paradise with you. Speaking of being with you, I've actually been to the Punahou School before. I visited back in 2015 when the Air Force Academy came out to play the University of Hawaii in football. And we brought a group of Air Force Academy folks over to your school uh, for a campus visit. And I was blown away by how gorgeous it was. You, you, you're just lucky to be able to go to school in such a setting. And uh, it was only exceeded by the hospitality that uh, you folks greeted us with. And I can still remember having a lunch up at, I think you call it the President's Pavilion. And yeah. So we had a, a, a great event. And even though I am 4,500 miles from you, literally half of a, a ocean and a continent away, I'm gonna call this my official second visit to the Punahou School. I'm also happy to be a part of this celebration as you folks take time to celebrate the upcoming birthday of Dr. King. Dr. King was just a towering figure in our history, having fundamentally changed who we are as a nation. And though we still have work to do, that's clear. I can personally attest to the fact that because of Dr. King's leadership of the civil rights movement, we've come a long, long way. And one of the highlights of my life was that I got to meet Dr. King and spend a little time with him in my hometown. And his words to me put me on a different track and fundamentally changed my life. So I was born in a small Southern town, Orangeburg, South Carolina, back when segregation was still the law of the land. It was at a time and in a place where for a young African-American kid like myself, opportunities were few. And some of the things you may have read about or heard about Maybe you've seen in a movie or on TV, I actually lived during my life. For example, when I was growing up, we had white only and colored restrooms. We had white only and colored drinking fountains. Most of the nice eating places were white only because white folks didn't want to eat with black folks in those days. Schools were segregated. Sporting events were segregated. We even had segregated county fairs. And when we'd go to the movie theater, white folks sat downstairs on the main floor and black folks had to sit upstairs in the balcony. Although for the life of me, I didn't, I, I didn't figure out why they thought that was a good idea. Because we used to throw popcorn and candy wrappers down on the white folks below kind of our way of uh, revolting against the segregation system. And I'll admit I did it too. But I didn't really give it much thought when I was a young kid, the segregation system, it was just the way it was. But as I began to get older, I also began to become more aware. 
my parents were school teachers. And early in my life, they took jobs in another town in South Carolina. But we kept our home in Orangeburg, and we would come home once or twice a month on the weekend. And of course, traveling back and forth, we'd have to stop for gas or stop to use the restrooms. And my dad would usually go in and ask for the restroom key. Now, because my dad was light skinned, fair skinned, he would often get the key to the white only bathroom. Then we'd all go use the restroom and then my mom would take it back. And when she got in the car, she and my dad would joke and we'd all laugh about how confused the attendant was that this colored woman has somehow gotten the key to the white only bathroom. Here's a picture of my mom and dad and I'll show you. And I often wonder how come I didn't get better looks than I did from that handsome looking couple. Um, the Civil Rights Movement came to Orangeburg in 1960. And Orangeburg was an interesting town because it had two all black colleges, South Carolina State University and Claflin University. And they were right next door to each other. And usually in a small Southern town, things would be fairly parochial, but because you had these black colleges in, in Orangeburg, you got kids from all over the place, from up North, from out West, where segregation wasn't an issue. And so they were very intolerant of the uh, rules of segregation in Orangeburg. I think they were also the impetus for the broader African American community in Orangeburg beginning to push back on the segregation system. And I can remember the first major event, uh, my dad and I were together downtown when it occurred. A lot of kids from the colleges came marching down the street, carrying signs, uh, protesting the white only lunch counters at the local five and dime stores. Now, for those of you not familiar with the five and dime store, they're like the dollar store today, but they had a, a lunch counter back in the day that you could order something to eat if you were white. Now you could shop in the five and dime if you were black, but eating was for whites only. And this is what the big protest was all about. And I remember the police showing up and the fire engines showing up and the firemen spraying the, the, the water hoses and knocking people down. And it's funny what you remember as a kid because what was so surprising to me was that fire hoses were that strong that they could just mow a crowd down like they did. The police came in and, and put off tear gas to disperse the crowd, and it was sheer pandemonium. Now, my dad and I were not involved, but from where we were, we could see the whole show. And from that day on in Orangeburg, for about the next 10 years, there was always something going on either a demonstration or a march or a sit-in or a boycott. And that was the environment that I grew up in in my hometown. By the way, I was nine at the time. Now, a couple of years later, I wanted to get more involved because I had a couple of buddies that had gone on a demonstration march. And of course they did it, I wanted to do it too. But my mom and dad said no. It was too dangerous and I was too young. And so they wouldn't give me permission to, to march in the demonstrations. About a year after that, a buddy and I were walking home and as was our habit, we cut through the college campus because it was the most direct route to get to our home. And we saw a big group of kids gathering together and we figured out it was the beginning of another march. And we figured we'd just go over and, and check it out hang around and see what was going on. There were some college ladies making uh, signs for the marchers. And one girl had just finished making a sign that said, we have waited long enough. She was a cute little girl, as I remember. And when she turned around, she looked at me and she said, here, you take this one. And she gave me the sign. And just like that, I was in my first civil rights march. 
we went downtown. We all got arrested. And as I was getting booked, um, the policeman asked me my date of birth. I gave it to him and he looked up. He said, where do you live? I said, right here in Orangeburg. He said, give me the phone number. Um, give me your phone number. And he called it. My dad answered the phone and he said, come down here, Mr. Thompson, get your son. He's at the police station. My dad came and got me and I was very disappointed that I didn't get to go to jail. The next day in the newspapers, uh, it said 1,033 students, mostly from the colleges, were arrested yesterday. But I knew that technically it was 1,034 because I had gotten to go home. Now, my best friend was a guy named James E. Sultan, Jr. His nickname was Warkey. His dad, James E. Sultan Sr., was a prominent black businessman in Orangeburg. He was also very active with the NAACP. He ran what was called an ESSO service station in those days. And as time went on, ESSO changed their name to Exxon, which is the brand that I'm sure you're familiar with today. He was also the treasurer for the NAACP, and it was his job to raise money to help bail the kids out of jail and to help pay the fines. And so he was very active, actively involved in the movement. Well, by now, the movement in Orangeburg had been going on for about four years, and the population was getting kind of weary. People were um, a little disenchanted and and disgusted with the lack of progress. And so the steam was kind of coming out of the movement. We needed an uplifting uh, shot in the arm, so to speak. And it arrived in the person of Dr. Martin Luther King coming to Orangeburg. Waukee and I were out in his backyard playing baseball when his dad opened up the door and called us in. And when we walked in the house, Dr. King sitting in the den. Mr. Salt took us over and introduced us. And we sat there and, and hung out with Dr. King for about a half hour or so. He was going to have a big speech that night, and he was at Mr. Sultan's house kind of resting before that speech. That night, he spoke at the Trinity Methodist Church, which was right across the street from the two colleges. And it was a moving and inspiring and just uplifting speech. He told us how our cause was just and righteous, and even though times were tough and there were turbulent waves that we had to, to wade through, that we were ultimately going to prevail. And he just reinvigorated the entire crowd and the entire movement. And as I sat there listening to him talk, I couldn't help but reflect back on the fact that I had been talking to him one-on-one -on -one just that afternoon. And I came away from the speech that night reinvigorated, uh, making a commitment to myself that I was going to be all in, both feet, as a frontline warrior on the civil rights battle. I joined SCLC, Teenage Division, and SCLC stands for the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, which was the organization that Dr. King had founded to uh, lead the civil rights movement. And I became an active volunteer, uh, going to the church after school and on weekends at times. Later that spring, I became uh, 14 years old and I was eligible to get a restricted driver's license in South Carolina, which meant I could drive from six in the morning until six in the evening. And because I was now mobile, I was eligible to become a member of Project SCOPE. Project SCOPE was a program of SCLC, but it was focused on educating and getting people registered to vote. Now, I never knew what SCOPE stood for. And when I thought about it as I prepared myself to talk to you folks, I Googled it to find out what it meant. SCOPE stood for Summer uh, community, organization, and political education. 
And, and, and what it was, was local volunteers like myself, combined with college kids from major campuses around the country who had volunteered to come down south to targeted counties, which had large black populations, and to help get people registered to vote. That's where the summer comes from, because these kids not in college during the summer would come down south. And I was paired up with a guy, redhead Irish guy, from the University of Michigan. And we hit it off right away. His name was Will, and he was a Boy Scout. And I was a Boy Scout. He was an Eagle Scout, and I was hoping one day to be an Eagle Scout. And most importantly, he had a car, and he let me drive. And having that new restricted driver's license and getting to drive a car around all the time was a big deal. And we drove all across Orangeburg County, out in the country on these dirt and dusty roads, looking for people to get them signed up and registered to vote. There were only two days, August 2nd and August 3rd that summer, where people would be uh, able to register to vote. And they were going to have to come into town and register at the courthouse. So we would go out with uh, sample registration forms and sit down and show them how to fill it out, what boxes to check, and where to sign their name or make their X if they couldn't write. We told them that if they needed transportation, we would arrange transportation to take them into town and, uh, and get them back. Or if they needed babysitting services, we'd have somebody come out and look after the kids. We were going to maximize uh, Black voter participation during those two days that we had. Well, the first day, we blew it out of the park registered over 600 uh, African Americans, brand new voters at the courthouse. In fact, the headline in the local paper the next day was that story. But it also got the white power structure very uneasy. And during the first day, we had three registrars working a full day at the courthouse. On day two, when we had just as many, if not more people, they only had one registrar there. The guy who was in charge of our program, a paid SCLC staffer, was a, a younger white guy, about 32 years old, whose name was Joe. And Joe went to the officials and said, you have to provide us three registrars for an eight hour day. I said, well, one guy called in sick and the other's got a cow in the ditch. So he might be able to make it in later in the afternoon, we'll see. Well, five o'clock came and the official came and said, the courthouse is closed. Everybody's got to leave. There were still people in the line waiting to register to vote. And Joe said, we're not leaving until you get three registrars for an eight hour day. He said, well, if you don't leave, we're going to call the cops and arrest you for trespassing on government property. Well, most of the people who had come to register to vote left after that. But all the volunteers, some of the people who wanted to register to vote, and Joe and his assistant, we all stayed. Joe said, three registrars, eight hours a day. The guy left, and we went down the hall and had an impromptu sit-in in the main court, in the courthouse. Started singing freedom songs. There was a, a balcony off the back of the courtroom. And I went out on the balcony after a while just to get a breath of fresh air. And I could see all the police uh, agencies marshalling their forces down on the, on the streets. There was the Orangeburg City Police, Orangeburg County Sheriff's Department, and the State Highway Patrol. And then I saw my grandmother walking on the sidewalk on the street below. So I yelled at, Grandma, Grandma. And she looked around trying to see where I was. And I said, up here, up here. She looked up and she said, boy, what are you doing up there? I said, I'm about to go to jail. When you get home, call mom and daddy and tell them I won't be home tonight. Well, about 15 minutes later, the cops all came in. And they gave us one more chance to leave. And Joe said, three registrars for an eight-hour day. And the cops came in and all took us away. 
We went limp, which was our nonviolent way of protesting so that they would have to carry us out. And they were actually tougher on the white kids who were from out of town across the country than they were on us. And some of them got clubbed and kicked and, and punched because they were viewed as the outside agitators who were coming in and stirring good black folks up. Well, my dad came down to bail me out of jail the next day. And the jailer walked about five or six of us down the street and, and back to the courthouse to the judges conference. Uh, he was there with our parents and he told us we were gonna be released into their custody and that if we didn't get into trouble again, he would make sure that our records were expunged. And I was proud that I had finally got to go to jail. Later that month, the end of the month, I joined 11 other kids, uh, 12 of us out of a student body of 1,200 who were integrating what had been all white, Orangeburg High. And I will never forget my first day of school. You see, there were only two high schools in my hometown. There was Wilkerson High School, the Black High School, which was one block up and two blocks over from where I lived. And then there was the much nicer Orangeburg High School, the white high school. But it was over on the other side of town, so we were going to have to be bused to get over there. Well, I left home on my first day of school, and I went down to the end of my street to wait for that bus. I was by myself because I was the only kid in my neighborhood crazy enough to volunteer to go to Orangeburg High. Well, after waiting for a few minutes, I noticed off in the distance, several police cars with their lights flashing headed in my direction. And I thought, wow, that must be a big accident on up the road. Imagine my shock when that caravan of police cars and the school bus stopped right in front of me. This was my federal marshal and state trooper escort on my first day of high school. Well, I got on the bus, we picked up a couple more kids and then we headed on over to Orangeburg High. And I'm sitting there thinking, man, this is so cool to have a police escort to high school. I didn't know the white kids had it so good. We rode for about 15 minutes, and as we came around a curve, Orangeburg High came into view. We took a right turn into the school parking lot, and our official welcoming committee was there to greet us. A baseball bat, axe handle wielding, angry mob who rushed up and began to pound on the side of the bus before the cops could come in and push them all back. And they were yelling and screaming obscenities and racial slurs and telling us that we didn't belong over here, that we should go back to our own side of town. And as we got off the bus and walked down through these two lines of screaming humanity, being threatened, being called names, and Tuh! be spat upon, I got to tell you, folks, turn around and getting back on that bus seemed to be the smart thing to do. You would think that it would have been the easier thing to do, but it wouldn't have been in keeping with the core principles that my mom and dad, William Pearl, had taught me. Principles of integrity, keeping your word and doing what you said you're going to do. Like discipline, always finishing what you started both parts of the larger principle of excellence, always doing the very best that you can do. So despite the fear, and the fear was real, we didn't turn around and get back on that bus. And because of those ingrained core principles, I couldn't turn around and get back on that bus. And that was day one of four of the toughest, most turbulent, but in many respects, the most enlightening and educational years of my life. We stepped off that bus that day and we walked into history. Now, I knew that when I went over there, things were gonna to be tough and some days were gonna be better than others. I knew that most people were gonna judge me simply because I had a better and a more natural tan. But I also knew that Willie and Pearl expected me to do my best, even when the times were tough, even when I was having a bad day. And folks, that is a skill that you've got to develop and then master to enjoy any substantial long-term success. So what's the lesson in the story? Simply this, that 
everybody's got to deal with challenges in life, even as a 14-year-old kid. But you can't let those challenges, you can't let that turbulence that you're dealing with be an excuse or a reason to keep you from having and striving for and achieving excellence in your life. And that's something that I learned from my parents and that was uh, enhanced in the conversation that I had with Dr. King. He said some yes. of the same words. It was interesting that Dr. King and my parents had the same definition of excellence. I guess it was an old school thing back in those days because excellence was defined by both simply as doing the very best you can each and every time, no matter what it is you're called to do. And Dr. King's got a great quote on that very point. I, I... He says, if you, are a, if you are called to be a street sweeper, you should sweep streets even as Michelangelo painted or as Beethoven composed music or as Shakespeare wrote poetry. He said, you should sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will pause and say, here lived a great street sweeper who did his job well. My daddy used to say something. <laughs> Success in life is seldom the result of natural gifts or talents. And as I told you before, he started off his career as a teacher. He had two masters, yet he'd say, it's not even about educational level or more than average intelligence, but it is about a commitment to excellence. He said, William, if you do your best, you're gonna do better than most, even people more talented than you, because most people aren't gonna give you their best. Most people aren't committed to excellence. And over time, I found that to be true. And applying that one principle has worked for me over and over and over again. And it can work for each one of you too. The end of the story in Orangeburg High. I survived those four years. In fact, I thrived during those four years at Orangeburg High, earning a National Merit Commendation in Academics, all American honors in football, AAU recognition in track, and appointments to two service academies. And as Gabby said, I was African American from South Carolina to go to the Air Force Academy. I share that with you, not to brag and not to impress you, but to impress upon you that even when you're dealing with significant turbulence in your life, and for me, it was four years at Orangeburg High, you can still choose, and I emphasize choose because it is a choice. You can still choose to live a life of excellence. That's the lesson that I took from Dr. King and my parents. It's what inspired me so much as a result of that short conversation that I had with him. And it's the message that I leave with you today as you celebrate on Monday, what will be Dr. 92nd birthday. Thank you, Punahou, and I am Captain T. I think we're going to do some Q&A now. Is that uh, on the program? Yes, that's yes, right. right. So if you All have right, any great. questions, um, please put them into chat. Um, so to start off with, we have the first question. Um, as someone who has been involved in this seemingly lifelong battle for racial equality from a young age, would you say that the youth of today are doing enough? I think some are. Um, I can't remember her name, but I'm sure you can help me. Who's the young lady from Europe that's uh, focused on climate change? I mean, there's a great example. <laughs> Greta Thunberg. Yeah, Greta, there she is, exactly. There's a perfect example. And, and she demonstrates, I think, perfectly how age doesn't matter. It's your commitment to a cause, commitment to the right cause. And there are many of, of them out there that that uh, will drive you as a person 
to to doing the right thing. And so now there are other folks that are just partying, hanging out <laughs> and wasting time, right? But there's there are some youth of the day that are really stepping up and doing outstanding things. Um, the second question is, uh, during the civil rights movement, there are varying approaches as to how to reach equality. Which did you favor? Were you someone who saw reconciliation via communication and peaceful protesting as a correct answer, or were you someone who sought out something more intentional? Well, because I was a follower of Dr. King, uh, my approach was nonviolent. Now, I, I will also tell you that there uh, were some players, the Black Panthers in those days, uh, Huey Newton, Bobby Seale. Um, it was a good. It was a guy that got arrest, arrested arrested um, in an event that I was involved in, who was considered to be a quote unquote black power leader. Um, and 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 you know what? They had a point. Now I chose nonviolence, but if you get a chance after this call, I want you to Google the Orangeburg massacre. It's when. 35 kids got shot, three of which died um, by the Highway Patrol and National Guard. This was before Kent State, and because it was at a black school, it didn't get the national publicity that uh, Kent State got. Um, but it was before Kent State. And so when you see those sorts of things happen, there is an argument for protecting yourself. But that's not the way that I chose to go. And I think overall, it was better for the overall civil rights movement to have been nonviolent and to have uh, gone the way of Dr. King. As someone who witnessed and experienced the civil rights movement firsthand, what are some of your thoughts um, on protests against injustice this past year, and are there some specific things in this country that you can wish that you wish could be changed? Well, the thing that I wish could be changed is that we're all just judged on our, the character of our content, and, uh, and 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 not on superficial things that often people make judgments by. But with respect to uh, the more recent Black Lives Matter protest and I'm sure that's what you're referring to. I think I'd have to separate um, Black Lives Matter into two different things. Now, there is an organization that was started that's called Black Lives Matter. Um, and I'm not intricately familiar with the organization, although I have been to their website before, and I get a general sense for what they're talking about. I think Black Lives Matter has been in a sense co-opted as a movement or as a phrase, phrase phraseology for the overall um, reaction to police uh, killings of, of uh, African Americans in the, not only the last year, but over a period of time. And so I think those two things are distinct. And so from a larger picture standpoint of view, from the standpoint of just the Black Lives Matter slogan, I don't think it, um, it's been interpreted correctly by a lot of people. Of course, all lives matter. And the only reason people are, are, are emphasizing that Black Lives Matter is because of the disproportionate number of African Americans that seem to get, to get gunned down by police, as opposed to people that would be going to your school, as an example. And so I think, um, it's a legitimate issue, uh, and it's certainly open for a broader community and governmental discussion in terms of how we police, in, particularly in communities of color these days. Um, thank you so much for the talk, but I think we're going to start wrapping it up. Hi, my name is Cadet Irison. Thank you, Captain T, so much for taking the time from your schedule to share your remarks with all of us for this special remembrance during these incredible times. Our JROTC program will be purchasing several copies of your new book, The Flight to Excellence, Soaring to New Heights in Business and Life for our school and cadet library. 
In addition, we would like to present a copy of your book to a couple of local nonprofit organizations committed to improving the lives of young people in our community, Palama Settlement and Hawaii Youth Challenge. Excellent. And thank Hi. you. Sorry. Hi, everyone. I'm Kori Matsuzaki. It is our hope that someone through these organizations, whether it be leaders, staff, or young students, will read your book and be inspired by its contents. Here to acknowledge this gift is Mr. Jackson Nakasone, president and principal broker for the local business CBI and a longtime supporter of the Palama Settlement. Mr. Nakasone. I'm not too sure we can hear you. Mr. Nakasone, is it possible if we can get closer to the mic, maybe? I don't have yeah, mute on. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Mr. Nakasone, but I don't think we can hear you. Sorry about that. He needs to get his audio technician on it right away, right? <laughs> um, we also have here, uh, welcome Mr. Conrad Louie, the executive di director of Palama Settlement, Mr. Louie. Hi, I uh, enjoyed um, listening to you this morning, uh, Captain T. You know, on behalf of uh, Jackson Nakasone Palama Settlement, the trustees, you know, um, we really appreciate, like, um, your book and look forward to kind of digging deeper into it. You know, as, you know, Palama Settlement, our mission where we serve the underserved and, you know, those with the greatest needs, so, you know, look, you know, hearing your story, I mean, really reflects on a lot of the things, what we're trying to do in terms of improving the community and the kids in the community. So, you know, thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. Absolutely. And, and, and thank you for being a part of the, the audience to listen to me today. I think Conrad said it all. Uh, it's just that, you know, my... Uh, the kids that come in that neighborhood and the families that come in that neighborhood for socioeconomic differences. And, you know, it's, uh, I, I really believe you, you, you can take the kid out of Kalihi, uh, but things won't change for them unless they experience different experiences and, and get aware of, of what's happening. Uh, you know, inside to the book, uh, most of the young faces I see here don't remember those situations and challenges that the black community uh, went through and continues to go through and the challenges and the, uh, what surprised me in this whole thing with the presidency and what we've gone through, I always thought education was the vehicle for equality. And what I find in, in our Congress and in, in what took place, you can have education, you can have all the credentials, but if your values are deep rooted and, and, and prejudice is deep rooted, education will not change it. And it starts at a very, very early age. And I'm, you know, I, I wasn't quite sure what this uh, uh, invitation was all about. Uh, just being so busy in, 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 in business, but I I am very, very fortunate, uh, T, that I, I got to meet what you're doing and I, I got to meet the young women and the educators of, of Punahou because it goes beyond 
what we're trying to do at Palama and, and from the heart. Thank you. Thank you humbly very, very much. And I hope we can continue the values that you talked about striving for excellence in their personal lives and in what they're trying to do as a young adults. And uh, we, we humbly expect uh, accept the honor today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. You're very welcome. And thank you for those very kind words. Thank you, Mr. Nakasone and Mr. Louis. We would also like to welcome Ms. Kahikina Abuluyan, who is the program coordinator for Hawaii Youth Challenge. Ms. Abuluyan. Aloha and good morning. A uh, big mahalo to you, Captain T, uh, for just sharing. And thank you for Punahou Jero TC for sharing um, the flight to excellence with the Hawaii Youth Challenge Academy. Um, the cadets at our academy, they are the At Promise Youth of Hawaii. So they, um, similar to Palama Sentiment, we help um, those underserved population of youth. And unfortunately, I don't have any um, cadets here with me. They just started our program, which is a residential program on Wednesday, and they're currently going through that acclimation phase. So we teach um, our academy deploys um, the quasi-military structure. So they, your book could definitely add a lot of value to one of our cadets. Um, it sounds like, even though, just like what um, Palama Settlement said, it's not about academics, it's about grittiness is the keys to success, you know, like excellence. Having that guts, resiliency, um, intensity or initiative and tenacity, which is what I'm sure a lot of us have and, and that commitment to excellence. So thank you so much for thinking of us and we are gladly to accept this gift of the flight to excellence by Captain T. Thank you and you're very welcome. Thanks for those kind words. My name is Cadet Julia Mamiya, Cadet T. In appreciation for your visit today, Cadet Sean Schofield is holding up a copy of Ka Punahou that commemorates our school's 175th anniversary in 2016, as well as our unit's challenge coin that we will mail to you. Mahalo for an, an inspiring presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, look forward to getting it from you. Thank you. Now, on behalf of the Punahou Boxing Union, Cook Learning Center, and JRTC, this concludes our program. Thank you for your attendance, and everyone can please give Mr. Captain T a proper mahalo and aloha. Thank you so much. Mahalo! Thank you. Hopefully, I'll get to come out and see you in person soon. <laughs>